Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Data Diversity. We'd like to thank you for joining today's Data Diversity webinar, Getting Started with Data Stewardship. It is the latest installment in a monthly series called Data Ed Online with Dr. Peter Aiken, brought to you in partnership with Data Blueprint. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Data Ed. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of your screen for that feature. And to continue the conversation and networking after the webinar, just go to community.adiversity.net. And to answer the most commonly asked questions, as always, we will send a follow-up email to all registrants within two business days containing links to the slides. And yes, we are recording, and we'll likewise send a link of the recording of this session as well as any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Dr. Peter Aiken. Peter is an internationally recognized data management thought thought leader. Many of you already know him or have seen him at conferences worldwide. We were just talking about the Data Architecture Summit in Chicago coming up that he'll be at. He has more than 30 years of experience and has received many awards for his outstanding contributions to the profession. Peter is also the founding director of Data Blueprint. He has written dozens of books, uh, dozens of articles, and 11 books, and the most recent is Your Data Strategy. Peter is experienced with more than 500 data management practices in 20 countries and consistently named as a top data management expert. Some of the most important and largest organizations in the world have sought out his and Data Blueprint's expertise. Peter is, has spent multi-year immersions with groups as diverse as the U.S. Department of Defense, Deutsche Bank, Nokia, Wells Fargo, the Commonwealth of Virginia, and Walmart. And with that, let me turn everything over to Peter to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. And welcome to you, Shannon. Thank you again for hosting us here, and uh, good to talk with everybody. So the topic today is stewardship, and while there's been a fair amount done with it, we haven't really codified the knowledge around that. So we're going to sort of approach that topic today. Uh, talk about why stewardship is needed, and to do that, you need to understand some contextual definitions, and particularly how the role of architecture works in organizations. We'll talk about the confusion that abounds around here because data has not quite found a home for itself yet and, and kind of needs to do that. Uh, a little bit around educational focus, not to beat up on anybody in education. We all try our best in education. I'm a, a tenured professor, so I don't want to bash us, but we, we are doing some things that could be improved in that area. A little bit on the role of strategy. Then we get to the how uh, one does data stewardship. And the real question is, you know, what are, is your role within the definitions of data governance in your organization? And that can vary among organizations, but it's important to define it. So I, I'd like to start out with sort of a fire station model and then talk about taking reactive or proactive approaches and, and maybe looking more to shifting from a reactive to a proactive approach. And then the question is, when, when do you get involved? Well, there are different cadences, uh, rhythms uh, between data and IT, and so we do have to figure out a different way of working within them uh, in that. We need a different structural approach in there. We need simplicity, and there are some foundational prerequisites that we have to get to. Uh, that should be about an hour, and we'll get to the top and talk uh, a little Q&A, which is uh, the real fun part of that, all this. So let's get started with the why. And <clears throat> I found this out there, and it was kind of an interesting thing. I, I don't know how many of you are data stewards now, but it's kind of nice when somebody says, the one person at work you can't possibly live without. I don't know that I you know, necessarily subscribe to that, but it certainly is a nice thought around the process because what a steward should be doing is helping facilitate somebody to work. Now, we work in work groups, and we'll approach those work groups in just a minute or so, but let's, let's look at, you know, first of all, a little bit of complexity around here. Here's a, a group that's formalized role of stewards in their organization, done a very good job of it uh, in terms of defining the roles and what types of things they're responsible for, although they take examples. And you want to be careful with examples because then somebody says, oh, I thought it was mine or I thought it was mine. And of course, really it belongs to everybody, so we don't want to say the word mine or own or anything around all of these topics uh, in here. So let's, let's actually go to the basics and start off with you know, definitions of steward. So steward is a person who looks after passengers and brings them meals. That sounds great. And I remember when the word was first coming out, 
we had colleagues in Europe that would say, yes, I expect you guys to, to show up with a martini tray and a, a napkin over your arm looking, looking proper, right? Uh, it's an official, it's somebody employed to manage something for somebody else, steward of a, an estate, for example. And so stewarding is managing or looking after, and then a data steward is managing data sets on behalf of others. Uh, the key is to represent a balance between stakeholders as well as the enterprise perspective and, and frankly, have dedicated time. Now, I get into a lot of arguments with organizations who like to say, well, you know, really what we'd like you guys to do is do everybody do 10%. Uh, if I say if, if you get 10 people to do 10%, I'd rather have one full-time person than 10 people part-time. It's not that they can't and haven't done very good jobs, but it'll be far easier to develop the organizational capability if I have somebody who's full-time dedicated uh, to that because they will build the trust, the, the belief in the organization that somebody actually understands this. And we will talk a little bit about the fiduciary aspects of it as well. Now, one of the, the interesting topics is, is a great book. A colleague of mine, David Plotkin, has written a really nice book uh, out there. And he, he describes all of these definitions here, which are really good. Uh, business data steward, a technical project, a domain, an operational, a metadata, a legacy data steward, all of which are appropriate roles. But, but what I'd urge you for starters is don't overcomplicate it. I've seen too many organizations go down a rabbit hole where they sit down and try to predetermine how things are going to be going forward. And of course, if you have this many steward types in your organization, you need an auditor because uh, we can't have everybody just running around doing things without somebody putting some controls in place. And then we need a manager to manage them on top of this. And as I said before, it's a very good book. I highly recommend it. David did a great job here. Um, the, the real key is this should be aspirational, something that we head towards as opposed to uh, you know starting off here because this is complicated for us and we do it. And just think how it appears to others who may not necessarily have an interest in it. So let's take it a little further. Uh, steward is somebody who uses the, oh, sorry, data steward is someone who uses the organizational data assets in support of organizational missions. Uh, the key is to take those data assets and use them in support of strategy in a way that really works. So what do the stewards do in our organizations? They try to generally improve the organization's data assets and value and evangelize for and try to change hearts and minds around the process and a little bit of controls uh, in the process. Now they, they don't have very much and uh, lot, lots of resources in some organizations. So you have to prove yourself and, and this means outside of regulatory, other mandated types of environments, it really does mean that you're going to have to be kind of entrepreneurial uh, about doing that particular process. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, one of Gwen Thomas's wonderful uh, uh, cartoons here, yeah, why right. does somebody need to be diplomatic to be a data steward, right? Well, especially if you're the first one, it can be a, an invigorating process. So uh, here's our Dimbach wheel. Hopefully you're not seeing it for the first time. This, of course, was version one. Version two looks like this. The difference is we have added a, a wedge on the side here for data integration and operability. And really, data governance and, and integration are areas that data stewards in play very strongly in. Now, let's do a high-level definition of data governance. Once again, there's lots of definitions, but my favorite is this one, managing data with guidance. The nice way this definition works is that you can ask the opposite question. Would you want your sole non-depletable, non-degrading, durable asset managed without guidance? And most people say, nah, I don't think so. I'd like to manage with guidance. So let's look at the governance and architecture aspects of this. First of all, we have corporate governance. Uh, and again, this is sort of a, a general motherhood and apple pie, or at least it was until uh, August, and, and all of a sudden a number of prominent CEOs came out and said, you know, it's not just all about maximizing shockholder wealth. Now, we have yet to see action on this, but the fact that it's even being discussed is a really wonderful thing and has a bearing on corporate guidance, which can have a bearing directly, of course, on the types of data that we're required to maintain. Uh, you probably also heard the controversy recently about the SAT dropping their plans for a adversity score on the uh, SATs. Again, very interesting data problems there. Will these fall under corporate guidance? And corporate guidance then, we also, of course, have IT guidance. And you know, what is IT focused on? Well, they'd like to be aligned with the business strategy and uh, provide measurable results and, and key questions. Uh, there are five areas that they recommend, strategic alignment, value delivery, resource management, risk management, and performance measures. So great stuff. We're, we're very pleased with all of this. Let's shift our topic a little bit and talk about architecture. Now, most people haven't done a lot with architecture, but it's it's really a, a, an excellent craft for data people to be able to work with. And most of you are actually quite good at it already, just may not have done it. We're talking about abstracting things to the level of things, 
the function of those things and how those things interact. I'll turn the volume down there. That's a little bit too loud. And, and why that's important, again, things, the function of those things and how those things interact. Why is that important? Because all organizations have architectures. The question is, has it been documented? If it hasn't been documented, it's hard to be widely understood and therefore useful. So once we can document and understand this, then we can start to become useful in employing our data assets in support of organizational strategy. And of course, we're really talking about data all the way around, so I'll just insert the word data and all of that, and the same thing is still true. Let's take a quick look at some organizational architectures just to give you some practice with this. These are sort of funny, but sort of true. Amazon, traditional structure, Google, team of three. Well, we know they've changed around. This is old, obviously. Facebook, do we really have a structure? Microsoft, eliminate their own products. Apple, everything revolves around run individual, and, and Oracle buys another company and, and subsumes it into the beast. So these are ways in which you use architectures, and all of them you know, have sort of interesting pieces. But organizations manage architectures in general, processes, systems, business, security, technical, and of course, data and information. Now, if they, if they consider you just doing technical committees and they don't understand what the technical committees do, this is a problem leading, of course, to the lack of understanding. Because what we're trying to create here with our efforts as stewards is better clarity around data. Data measurements, data utility, data sources, all things data. And so stewards are going to become expert in these areas. Now let me take a, a quick definition of information architecture and you'll see the role stewards play. Uh, we have some very good definitions that are out there. My favorite, of course, is mine, which is common vocabulary Imagine you're trying to explain to an executive on the way up in an elevator what an enterprise architecture is useful for for that individual's organization. And if you describe models and diagrams and things, yes, there's, okay, yeah, yeah, right. If you say I provide a common vocabulary, they go, yeah, I have a lot of problems with people not speaking the same language in my area, and it puts sand in the gears, slows things down. And of course, there's always been confusion because IT has always thought that data is a business problem. If they can connect to the server, my job is done is a quote we've all heard from IT many times. On the other hand, business clearly thinks IT is managing the data. Why else would, where else would it be taken care of? So data has fallen into this enormous chasm and we need to repair that partnership between IT and the business and that's really the role also of data stewards. Oh my goodness, you didn't know what you were getting into here. A quick Dilbert just to divert us. The committee decided that the file naming convention will start with the date in order of month, year, and day. Of course, those of you that are following carefully know that we've already screwed up by not putting in a standard way of describing date time, which means it will be difficult to access in the future. <gasps> Next panel. And then a space and the temperature of the airport, the hat size of the nearest squirrel. To be perfectly honest, it was a long meeting and we probably didn't do our best work toward the end of the meeting. Knowledge workers, the people who make up our work groups, the people who, with whom we all work, they're not taught about data. And yet my definition of a knowledge worker is somebody who works with data. 100% of them should. Worse still, we for decades have people, taught people one thing about data as part of their IT curriculum, which is how to build a new database. If there is a skill we do not need any more of on planet Earth, it is how to build a new database. We could use some skills around how to work with existing databases, so that would be great. So question is what impressions, not just on the people who learned this, but also the people who went through and became managers of, of other people, they get the idea that we don't need data people on these projects because we're not building a new database. I'm doing ERP, that's not a new database, is it? Or I'm migrating things, that's not a new database, so I don't need this data people in here. And literally they have they have fallen in terms of what they used to do for the organization and what they're currently asked to do. And the result of all this is a bunch of really smart people who just are not knowledgeable about data. And they make bad data decisions which results in poor treatment of data assets and poor quality data, as well as poor organizational outcomes. So how are we going to fix this? And most importantly, it's not so much how are we going to fix this, but what approach are we going to take this? So let's talk about the role of strategy, because everybody wants to do strategy now. You may be saying, why are data stewards involved with strategy? Well, you're a key player in this role. Data strategy provides you focus. Over time, We've used the word strategy more and more, 
but that's mainly because the business groups have picked up on it and started to use it. There are lots of long and complicated definitions of strategy and, and you know, parts of a document and templates that you can download off the Internet and things. I prefer things simple. So Henry Mintzberg has a definition I like, which is a pattern in a stream of decisions. Now, why is that important? Again, remember a few minutes back I was describing to you all the way in which you need to present information to people in ways they can understand it here. Um, we also need to do this to the rest of our data community, which means we need to make things simple for them. Let's give three examples of this. And the, the third example is a complex strategy. So the first example is Walmart's former business strategy. You guys can see where this is going. Every day, low price. Well, I'm not telling you anything you didn't know, and you know why? Because Walmart wants you to understand that. They, every person who did business with them, who worked for them, who had a family member that was associated with them, understood. And more importantly, this became the default mode of operating. It became part of the DNA, the corporate culture of the organization. If you make a decision, you make it in favor of the customer receiving low price, you made the right decision. That's comforting for people to work with. And Walmart uses um, culture very, very well to its advantage in the marketplace here. Second definition of strategy, excuse me, second example of strategy, Wayne Gretzky, great Canadian hockey player. He skates to where he thinks the puck will be. You're chasing a huck around, which is a hard piece of plastic that weighs a little bit, and you're hitting it with large sticks. It's going to move very fast. And if you chase it, you'll always play catch-up. So he doesn't play catch-up. He says, I'm going to change the game by going to where I think it will be. And if I am where I think it will be and it comes to that place, I will be in position to become the greatest scorer in history at the time. Third example strategy, Napoleon at Waterloo. He's facing two armies. The army in red is the British. The army in black is the Prussians. And they're bigger in combination than Napoleon's French corps. So question, how do you defeat the competition when their forces are bigger than mine? The answer is divide and conquer. Let's look specifically around this. First thing that this strategy is still taught in military history books uh, today because it is a brilliant strategy. Uh, it didn't work, but that's a different issue. Um, lines of supply were one of the things that you look at when you look at an army because if you push the army back, they're more likely to run towards their food than away from it. I don't mean that just statistically, but there's obviously a biological function that works there as well. Same thing here. So the, the Prussians were provisioned out of Liege, and the British were provisioned out of Ostend. You can see they are miles apart and in opposite directions. So Napoleon's theory was divide, and let's do that. So his key, whoops, oh, I'm sorry, I went too many fast. So let's divide, first of all. I'll just go back to that slide. And the key with divide is that you take your forces and mass them very strongly at one particular point, and you hit really hard, okay? Then, point two, you then conquer, and the conquer has to be sequential. The first one is we're going to turn to the right and defeat the Prussians, and then we're going to turn to the left. So let's go over this strategy. Well, I said before, it's complex. Hit both armies really hard at just the right spot, because if I'm too far to the left or too far to the right, my strategy of dividing them will not work. Second component of the strategy, turn to the right and defeat the Prussians. If half of us turn to the right and half of us turn to the left, we will not survive. And then when we've defeated the Prussians, turn to the left and defeat the British. Oh, and by the way, do this while somebody is shooting at you. That's a hard thing to get a lot of people to do, even if they're trained to do this, much less your organization that knows nothing about data. So keep things at this level. A pattern in a stream of decisions is a great way to think about this. There's another whole talk we do later on this year on strategy on this, but just sort of a, a word to, to wrap it up. On strategy itself, if you've got strategy and somebody says, I've got to go find it and read it, it's probably not going to get used. So the famous Eisenhower quote on this is that, uh, well, he thought that the plans were nothing. The planning process was, in fact, everything. And that's a very good set of guidance to take us with. Because this data strategy looks at the problem of saying, I've got all this organizational data, and I've got this limited amount of people, full-time, part-time, whatever they happen to be. That's going to be a component of my solution. We're also going to use some technologies, absolutely appropriate. In this case, I'm showing the 
fulcrum and the, the, the lever here. Uh, those two pieces are both necessary. While you could move the organizational data without the purple thing on the left, the fulcrum, um, it would be more efficient to do it this way than, than not, but it can be done. These are engineering calculations. We get the right people and understand them. We do a process. That'll, that'll work out as well. We've also got to work on some aspect of this, which is called data rot. And data rot is something that's problematic, but if you've got data that's redundant, obsolete, or trivial, reducing the amount of it will make you easier to focus on the remainder and do good work on that particular piece. So let's talk a little bit. The terminology is not done, widely known. This is something we're going to be educating ourselves and our colleagues about because we haven't been doing it for 6,000 years the way some of the accounting practices have actually been working on. We don't have agreed upon definitions. And there's no point in arguing about them because time will tell more so than, than prognosticating about what will likely happen, uh, what actually does. It's clear that data governance is personal. And it's also clear, therefore, that data stewardship is also going to be similarly personal. It has, however, become de facto standard to have people in charge of the data, and that seemed to be an argument that was pretty easy to, to make. Stewards work very effectively with architectural components. They help us do a number of different things, and we'll talk about this in just a second. The strategy focuses steward leveraging activities. While there's lots of things we could do, which are the things that if we do them correctly and now will actually result in what we need to have? So that's sort of our first section on why. Let's now talk about how stewards actually work. First of all, most of you understand that there's a version of this somewhere in your office which says implicitly or explicitly, our process for turning data into information is overly dependent on human beings. Wet wear, that's the stuff between our ears. Knowledge workers, informal communications. It's described as the weakest link in some organizations uh, on this. And the, the simple fact of it is that organizations don't know what data they have. They don't know where it's at and they don't know where the knowledge workers do with it. And that, while presenting additional sources of risks, also include efficiency components on this. Work groups are what get done. And data stewardship happens currently at the work group level pretty well. There is some issue with if you're, everybody's learning on their own, you're pretty sure they're not using a standard. And if one standard is better than another, then there's no opportunity to gain efficiencies from doing things the same way. But nevertheless, we can, we can move towards that. And, and that's certainly a, a, a thing to think about in there. Because right now, people are doing informal practices. Only one in 10 people that are using Excel know that there's a capability for doing what you're doing in Excel perfectly every time, automating that process called macros. One in 10 people just give you an idea of the, the, the opportunity we have for uh, improving efficiencies in that area. But the real value of all this comes from making cross-work group connections work more smoothly because when we're starting to go back and forth across things, that's where you really realize that the data chaff becomes sand and it prevents smooth interoperation and exchange or it slows them down. Most organizations experience kind of a death by a thousand cuts but it's been difficult for them to account for them. They just know it's not working the way it should. And that's because organizations and individuals lack the knowledge and the skills in those areas. So I've already mentioned this for starters. First thing, as a general thing that stewards are doing, is that they're helping people to understand that better organized data increases in value. If you have trouble illustrating that point to people, take a book and remove the spine so it's just a bunch of pages, and then mix the pages up and hand them to somebody and ask them to enjoy their read. Um, they will not. Even the set that you're giving them actually has page numbers all the way across it, which is kind of cool, but not as good as it could be if you hadn't taken the spine off and messed up the paper. Yes, better organized data increases in value, if nothing else, because your knowledge workers will be able to find what they're trying to find faster. And if they're finding it faster, that means your organization can spend time doing the things it's good at rather than on routine description time wastes. Uh, Tom Redman calls them hidden data factories. It's a good term. Poor data management practices are con costing organizations a lot of time and money. And the only argument I get with this statistic is that it's not 80% for our organization. It's 90%. What is rot? I've already mentioned it once. Redundant, obsolete, or trivial data. And if the data is redundant, obsolete, or trivial, why would you want to maintain it at all? My wife corrects me from time to time and says it's actually riot because it's redundant, incomplete, trivial, obsolete, and she's correct. 
but I already put Rod out there, so we'll have to worry about that. The question is just like in advertising dollars, which 80% can I safely eliminate? By the way, I'm not advocating going out and eliminating 80% of your data with help, proper stewardship, but uh, it is something that uh, a general good high goal to take a look at. So yes, redundant and obsolete trivial gets in the way, and the remainder makes it easier to focus our efforts as stewards on improving them by making them more understandable and also making descriptions about how they're used in the organization also understandable. There's lots of other things that go into it as well. But greater quality data gives us more engineering leverage as we're trying to do whatever it is our organization does, whether you're nonprofit, whether you're in the, the government, or whether you're in the private sector, there's still a mission, and that is important to take into consideration. Because integration, the process of our disparate working groups working together without these information architecture components is not possible. And maintenance of these components also then promotes greater reuse, which means that data sharing is becomes exemplified by the ability to use information as a strategic asset. And there's lots of examples of that that are, that are really good. We won't go into a bunch of them here, but you can certainly get lots of uh, webcasts that, that do this and describe it in that sense. Data is the most powerful, underutilized, poorly managed organizational asset. It's the only resource that you have that is not depletable, not degrading, durable over time at the strategic level. Data assets really do win when you compare them to other data assets. And yet, people talk about them incorrectly. Data is not the new oil. Don't let people think about it that way. I don't mean correct people in public. But you don't think about oil as a reusable commodity. You instead think about it as something that you use once and don't use again. And that's not the way to think about it. It's not a production function. It's a cultivation function that we have to think of it as. A good way to think of it is just to change one letter in that previous statement and make it the new soil. The idea is that you plant things in it, and you don't just throw seeds on the ground, but you plant them in a prepared plot. And then you don't plant things on Monday and expect to eat them on Friday. It doesn't work. It takes time. Uh, on the other hand, data is usually sold as bacon, which is really fast and sizzly and great, but data does deserve its own strategy. The, it deserves attention that's on par with similar organizational assets, and it deserves professional administration to make up for past neglect. Now let's look at data strategy in context in here. Organizational strategy is developed. Our purpose in data is to support organizational strategy. Governance is about that process, and strategy is an essential component for data governance. What the data assets need to do right now, not forever, but for a defined period, let's say for the next 30 days, our focus is going to be. This is the type of thing you need to do to address the challenges that you have in data. It, again, you've already seen it starts off generally with lots and lots of information out there that you have to winnow down to support uh, and get more of, but still, what the data assets do to support the strategy. And then the feedback from the governance group is how well is data supporting the strategy. That seems reasonable. Um, in Peter's world, you uh, also have domain and over IT projects and how that supports strategy, but that's a different argument. Let's not get into it right here, but fill out the picture with a couple more feedback loops. And I would never show most people that big diagram. I'd keep it kind of simple here. Uh, in particular, when most people think about data strategy, they really need to be thinking about specific business goals. So ways that we as the data stewards of the organization can harness resources around us, including ourselves, to support the attainment of business objectives by better using the data that's in there. And our language in governance, which means the stewards, will be metadata, so that they will talk. And that metadata will continue in the conversation with stewards who will then talk back and forth as they're working through things. Now let me give you a little bit of guidance around the process of starting a stewardship organization. First thing to do is to understand the role of frameworks, which is just a system of guiding ideas, a way that you can organize the project data, uh, priorities, decision making, a way of assessing progress. These are all good things. The simple things that are kind of obvious in this example, don't put up the walls until the foundation inspection is passed, right? Or put on a roof as quickly as possible because winter is approaching and our folks that are working on building the structure, whatever it is, will be cold. Uh, make it all dependent on continued funding so there's an obvious feedback loop so that people pay attention to what's going on here. I say framework because here's a data steward framework. Now, this is not data steward, I'm sorry, I said data steward. It's a stewardship framework, not a data stewardship framework. And they talk about 
interesting qualities, personal mastery, a vision, mentoring, promoting uh, and valuing diversity, coming up with shared vision for the organization, risk-taking and experimentation, entrepreneurialism, vulnerability and maturity. Again, that thin, thin skin thing is probably not a good attribute there. Raising awareness, delivering results. Not bad for a stewardship description. We won't see too many of them in the data area, but I'll give you a, another version of the same kind of thing. Stewards need to be thinking that there are specific data challenges that will help us use organizational data assets to better support the mission and strategy of the organization. And as we understand them, we will get them into some sort of strategic consideration because we can't do all of them. Some of them we'll address at some other time. Sorry, just got to put them in the bucket list and, and get them. We can't do it all. We can't do everything at once. We can't spread ourselves too thin. We've got to be concentrated and do a couple things well. So the stewardship engine, as I call it, has to do with, yeah, there's a component of regulation policy, but there's also stewardship activities as a subset of that, which I've already said can be reactive and proactive, which means that we're going to try and provide value. The value can be monetary in some cases. It can be non-monetary in other cases. But we've got to be able to show it because otherwise a new group will come in and say, oh, I don't think we're going to do that anymore. And uh, the initiative will lose all of its effort. And of course, over time, we'd like that value to be seen greater and greater, which means part of that stewardship piece needs to be building good articulate business cases so that people know what good work that you're doing and understand how it fits in with the rest of the organization. Let me give you a little bit more context and talk about your data community in general. Yours may or may not look exactly like this one, but I think the general components are recognizable to most groups. First of all, there is IT, and they provide the bedrock, the foundation. I'll put it in a standard 4 by 4 matrix. On the left-hand side of the red line uh, that is vertical, the domain expertise will be less. They won't know as much. They'll need to learn more. On the right-hand side, the domain expertise is greater. The roles are more formally defined on the left, and the roles are less formally defined on the right. Both of those things are true. Then on the horizontal axis, the bottom of the horizontal line, they're going to encounter data governed, excuse me, governed data, data that is governed more directly, whereas on top, they're going to less be direct encounters with it. I hit the wrong button and started over. Sorry, guys. Give me a second. I'll catch right up. And our last set of encoding here is that below the line, more time is dedicated to this process, and above the line, less price. Excuse me, less time is dedicated to it. So what have we got? Well, we've got leadership components. These are people that make decisions about data. And this is really their role. The problem is most of the time when they make these decisions, they don't realize that they are decisions about data. So that's part of our job is to educate them around that. Then there are the stewards, the group we're directly addressing today, these trustees of the data. And let's, again, let's not try to divide up all of our data amongst the three stewards that we have or 30 part-time people that we have. Let's instead focus on a couple of areas and, and get good with those areas and show that investing a full-time person in these three areas is quite well worth it from the organizational perspective. And, and that will give the incentive for more. But Because if we try to do everything and spread too thin, we will accomplish, of course, nothing. Working with us a lot are the participants, the experts, the data subject matter experts that are part of the fabric of how it uses. It's the gentleman with the SQL server under his desk that doesn't want IT to find out that this is how he's doing the logistics work that are working, or somebody with an unauthorized Amazon account that is doing things. And then there's others. They are all data makers or consumers in one form or another. So that's our universe. And let's now talk about, in this case, what some can define as a leadership group. Um, this may not be, again, for you, but some groups have said leaders and stewards will be part of the enterprise data group. Others include stewards and participants. It doesn't matter. But the, the role of this group, whatever you define it as, is to provide resources because we need to have some sort of programmatic sustainment. This cannot be done project by project. It's got to be programmatic. The data makers and consumers will provide data and feedback. Some of it will be directly to the leaders. Some of it will come through other folks. The leaders will make decisions, and the stewards will figure out what action needs to be taken by everybody else, what changes need to be made such that we can better use our data in support of strategy for this particular example. Again, more feedback comes through those ideas, but the stewards should get some ideas and provide guidance to the leadership. 
uh, in there. A little bit of a, a brief tour over it, but hopefully that helps you understand. And, and really, probably the best thing to do is take a perspective. Maybe you're a data leader listening to this and trying to figure out how to stand up a steward group. Hopefully this gives you an idea of, of the way to do it. But let's, let's talk about another idea that also is working in the data steward community. Yes, that's right. It's your local fire station. Now, everybody knows the typical role, which is the Dalmatian on the hood of the, the fire truck and rushing to save people's lives and put out fires. And absolutely fantastic stuff. And then there's the downtime as well. But they don't always sit at restaurants or buy food or, or play pool or whatever. What they also do is a lot of education. And it's a great model to watch. How the firefighters spend their time is a good way to think about it. I'm not suggesting that you go on 48-hour nonstop shifts. That's not what I'm suggesting. But the mode that they use to operate, which is part reactive and part proactive. You already have some pictures in your mind. Yes, there are those ones that are telling me to replace the batteries and the fire alarms. They're the ones that are telling me to, to move things around such that I'm not storing paint by the uh, 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 gas furnace uh, in the garage. You know, the, the, These are all good educational activities. So sometimes there's some things to do, and we need to do them. And sometimes there are less things to do, and we need to instead be working on a general education piece, a balance between the two things. So our goal is to start to transform the tribal knowledge-based processes into asset leveraging components. To understand that stewards transform governance into strategy-focused action. We're trying to do this. Can't be everything. Apply a framework to your tasks and get good at both reactive and proactive activities so that you can now start to incorporate your own direct leadership, but also leadership around the organization such that they understand that you are a resource. Because remember where we started, your best friend at work is what the steward should be. Know that you can't do everything. It's just impossible. There's been too much um, poor treatment of data over the years and too much redundancy to, to, to make it possible for anybody. And it's scary when you talk about people and say the time to correct these may take years and in some cases decades but it is still worth the effort. So the key is to get focus correct. The wrong question is not how should we manage this data, all of it, and trying to get it right, but the right question is should we include this data item within the scope of our steward practices for the next round that we're trying to do? Because if you just do stuff and don't have a repeatable process, you can't measure things and improve things. Some of you will see where I'm going when you get to that. Let's keep going. Another wonderful way to think of it is the MacGyver model. If you haven't seen a MacGyver, I think he's on YouTube now. Um, could fix anything with a piece of uh, scotch tape and a paper clip. Uh, and there's going to be a bunch of that. And the best thing that you can do as stewards is become part of the steward community. There's a fantastic organization called the Data Governance Professionals Organization and the Dataversity community that's there. So that's sort of some of the how. Let's dive a little further into what I call the when, and it's not what most people think about. So, for example, in organizations without stewards, uh, again, you've got two strategies. Your stewards can improve organization operations, or they can innovate, and there's no problem. But let's make sure that we don't do either, because that's not a good thing. Stewards do need to be actively involved in the focus of what they're trying to accomplish, improve things. And let's be absolutely frank and say that Walmart is expert at increasing organizational operational efficiencies. Absolutely fantastic. And Apple using creative opportunities. Okay? So Apple's the innovation. We'll pretend Apple allegedly innovates and we'll pretend Walmart is really good at it. And both of them are. So um, the key is I want you to imagine taking the people who are in the uh, area that is, oh, I don't try to do both, sorry. Got all mixed up here, don't try to do both. But I want you to imagine taking the people who are in the V3 area. Oh, boy, I really messed that one up. Let me go back. Uh, people who are in that V3 area and telling them to be cheap, right? Those are the innovators. Telling them to be cheap is not a good idea. And telling the people that are in the uh, operational efficiency exit to be innovative is also not the good idea. They are not the same skill sets. So you need to be sure that you sequence the type of thing when you're working on. Don't let people try to get involved in doing too much too fast. Focus in on the increased efficiencies and effectiveness, and then use the savings from that to fund some of the innovation opportunities. I apologize for making that a really bad 
thing, but you can edit out my uh, idiocy there and catch the rest of it. Let's look at another example. When you look at how data is done in most organizations, there's this data management piece that most people really don't understand. Uh, not through their fault, we haven't educated them about it. Something happens is about what they get. And what happens is data usually gets replicated or duplicated and then warehoused by put into the cloud. And then you may put a bunch of marts together so that you can focus on specific subject areas. If this looks Inman or Data Vault like, it should uh, absolutely appeal. But the problem is that the learning, the feedback loop that comes back from this, looking at the data, tends to go back to the ETL layer. And that's unfortunate because it should go back all the way to the data area. So again, as stewards, you need to have feet in both of these camps, the sort of BI world of, of data usage, analytics, and the, the, the data management practices end of it as well. Because what you learn from how analytics is done, it's kind of the wild, wild west in many organizations, uh, can give you good feedback that you can use to improve better data feeds for them and reduce the amount of time and effort they spend uh, munging the data because you've got the better leverage around all of that. Because as I said before, data is not a project. It's a durable asset that's got a very specific definition in uh, accounting terms. It's an asset with a useful life of more than one year, which means reasonable project deadlines, you know, in a project sense, maybe 90-day increments or two-week sprints or whatever you're doing, but the data evolution is measured in different terms. It just isn't possible to change that much uh, back to good from the current state. Data evolves. It is generally not created. It is significantly more stable across the years for organizations than are the process controls that they use. Uh, there are a bunch of different ways of approaching this, but the best way to think about it is to interface with agile development by providing a programmatic level of support that says only when the data elements are met uh, and fully understood and vetted and validated is it make sense to use those data elements in any Agile Sprint. And if you're using an Agile Sprint and discover that the data requirements are poor or not understood or misinterpreted, um, it's generally time to move on to another piece of coding. There's plenty more to do, but not put any more effort into that one because it will just result in a new smile pile of data, uh, which frankly will keep us all employed, but isn't the best for our organization. The, the alternative of creating data silos is, is very problematic. Let me quickly run through a set of kind of new concepts from a stewardship perspective, but to, to think about it in these terms. First of all, the, the thoughts I'm going to give you are wrong. Um, according to George Box, all models are wrong, but some are useful, and I fully subscribe to his model, so hopefully these will be useful. Um, developed a website called The Data Doctrine, and if it looks suspiciously like the Agile Manifesto that we were just talking about, it's because the words up there on the screen are exactly that. We are uncovering better ways of developing IT systems by doing it and helping others do it. Through this work, we've come to value data programs, preceding software development data, structures that precede stable code, shared data preceding completed software and data reuse, preceding repeatable code. And it's not that there's no value to the things on the right, but we value the things on the left more, which is exactly what the Agile Manifesto says. So hats off to them for doing a great job, and I hope this is useful here, because what really is happening is that there's a mismatch, and I alluded to it earlier by saying there was a, a cadence mismatch, an impedance is another word that we use uh, to do this. Because IT is very good at building new stuff, but as we've already said, data evolves over time. It's a much different rhythm, and it needs to be separated from. It needs to be made external to, and it needs to precede systems development lifecycle activities. If you do not, the only result is more small piles of disintegrated data. Again, guaranteed employment for all of us, but uh, we, we'd like to do better. So data management and systems development must be separated and sequenced. It just does not work. Uh, the data doctrine is out there. If you're interested, we'd love to get in the dialogue with you on that. And I'm going to close this little short section with an agile joke. Wait, you're going to perform surgery without putting me under, says the patient, not realizing he had signed up for agile surgery. And the uh, doctor says, yes, this is agile surgery. We need to ask you about your symptoms and complaints after we open you up. We'll also need to know what you want us to work on in the first round. As I mentioned before, most people have the strategy part of this incorrect. There's an organizational strategy, a data strategy, and an IT strategy, but they do not work in the way they are typically presented. This is simply wrong. So the right way to do it is that these need to be co-developed and that there needs to be coordination between the two. And quite frankly, because data has the slower moving aspects of this, 
data actually needs to govern some aspects of what IT does in terms of timing and sequences. Again, I've mentioned several times the process of going through this. It is taken directly from Elihu Golderat's book, The Goal, and adapted for us here. Uh, many of you remember Alex Rogo and his uh, adventures at Unical. If you don't, it's a wonderful book. And if you don't feel like reading, it is a great book on tape. But it views management systems as being limited from goal achievement by a constraint. And that's what you do. You define a business problem, draw a circle around it, and say, we're going to fix this goal. We're going to practice our process of getting good at it as well as our capabilities. There's always some constraint, and the focus is simply if there is a weak link in the chain, we need to find the weakest link and fix it because this architecture is all um, additive in nature. The idea is that we're, as stewards, making a better data governance sandwich. They say, what is a data governance sandwich? Well, uh, it starts out with varying levels and uh, capabilities of data literacy and various different levels of data supply because there's no one central directory or a data steward to help you go and find the stuff that you need. Uh, instead, you're supposed to go and find Fred or whatever it is. And the more streamlined, the more automated, the more, because remember these are occurring hundreds, thousands, millions of times daily, right, hourly in some instances, that we have to engineer them and make them fine turns. Remember, we're trying to eliminate hidden data factors, and this makes all of our operations smoother. And we need them all to work together, because if we can't get them all to work together, then we have no ability. And this Working together cannot happen without engineering and architecture in focus. It has to occur. I was on a tea farm in India a couple of years ago on a vacation, and I found this wonderful quote that said, quality engineering and architecture products do not happen accidentally. Of course, we know, again, we're talking data stewardship here, so we're talking data engineering and architecture. And if these topics are not familiar to you, then we need to start getting smarter about the process and looking for opportunities to educate ourselves and find out what aspects. I'm not saying mathematics, that you're going to be computing anything, but understanding weak link in the chain types of things. Because overall, in organizations, there is a very definite lack of things. There's a fundamental mismatch between a data program and an IT project. If you have trouble with this subject, find somebody in your organization who is PMP certified. It is an objective certification, and they will be able to point you chapter and verse to the kinds of things that you need to be able to understand these two terms. Data programs need to exist as long as your HR program exists. Projects have a beginning and an end, and data doesn't work that way. Fundamental mismatch. There are objective assessments that can be used to measure in advance progress, which is the repeatable process that I was describing. You won't know it at first, but after you've done it three or four times, you'll go, oh, I got this. As scale increases, so does the dependency on these architecture and engineering concepts, and harmonizing organizational IT and data strategies is absolutely key to being successful. Sequencing some aspects of this, of course, can be very, very helpful to the organization. See, there's a, a big issue. Most people sort of look at the world of IT, business, and data as data being the bat sign in the middle of everything. It's not a good way to think about it. And they kind of go, we'd like to get good at this and, and, and do more, right? This is sort of a, a vision statement. But they just don't realize that the way the world is is much more like this. And so your roles starting today are needed in an incredible, incredible incredible way. So this is the when component of all of this. Again, what we've covered is the why, why somebody needs to have data stewards. There's a lack of good treatment of data, and there's a lack of expertise about this. Um, obviously, good places to come learn about this expertise are the various data diversity offerings where we'll be appearing. You'll see the list of those coming up, but we'll all be gathering in Chicago uh, in the next month to uh, start the process of looking at the Data Architecture Summit. And how, how we as stewards interact as a, a relationship with governance. Uh, really, the fire station model is a good one. Even if you don't like it, tell it what you don't like, and it gives you something to describe what you do like. Oh, it's fire station but with uh, cute puppy dogs, right? I, I don't know, I'm making it up. And finally, the last component of this was the when. There's some sort of different cadence about this, which means there's a, a very strong need for a different structural approach. It can't go on as a project by project approach, and that is what IT is good at, which is why a data steward should not report into IT. 
I've said over all the way around that you need simplicity in this because the simplicity allows more people to understand more quickly. If we put barriers up, they will not be able to understand and can't be helpful to us. These are foundational prerequisites to getting everything else up and running. So I'm going to spend about 10 minutes here talking through some takeaways. And these are quite uh, in-depth, which is why I spend a little bit of time on this. First of all, the need for data stewards is increasing. However, we believe very strongly that this type of education can be provided by high schools or perhaps even um, uh, to your colleges, the community college level. There's all kinds of support. Uh, guess what? Veterans make fantastic data stewards because they understand the concept of stewardship inherently. And of course, the data volume is not growing any less. So what we don't have is, as everybody has said, a set of good practices around this that we can point to as a book. Maybe David Plotkin will write another book, or one of the rest of you will. Um, gosh, is Lively's next one? His next one is on governance. That's an update on that. Anyway, this is a new discipline. We haven't had it forever. So we are still learning, and we do not know everything. And trying to specify exactly what's going to happen 10 years from now is simply not worth the effort. Instead, take a proactive learning approach. Start doing some stuff better and then measure it and try to get better at getting better because you're going to have to conform to existing constraints. And there is no one best way. It's got to be instead deliver, delivered by a data strategy that complements the organizational strategy. People aren't going to know what you do is useful unless you can point to data strategy and say, this caused us to do that, which caused the business to achieve something better. And we've got to start practicing that. There are a lot of data strategy frameworks. We don't have time in this one to look at it, but if you just Google data strategy frameworks at images.google.com, you will see a bunch of them out there, or there's several old presentations of mine, I think past uh, uh, data diversity webinars that we've done uh, are out there that have these. But anyway, there's, there's a bunch of them. And the idea is not for you to adopt any or all, but to try them on and say, how would this work in our organization? IBM's data governance model may not give you as much as another organization's approach to it. And this gives you the opportunity to try it and see what works conceptually. Data stewards direct data management efforts. Oh, no, no, they just advise. No, who's going to do it if you don't, especially if you don't have a program? They are the first most important component of your data program. They're visible. In the Commonwealth of Virginia here, we literally called them Commonwealth Data Stewards and gave them badges. It was a fantastic move. It helped us to make sure that everybody understood that data steward language is metadata, that we need to speak in specific controlled vocabulary items, or more importantly, make sure that we start to turn them on and off, kind of like on the record, off the record kind of thing. Yes, this is a controlled word, which means we all know what we're talking about in here. If that didn't make any sense at all, ask a question at the end, but that's a, a, an aspiration rather than a starting place for you. And finally, there's really good aspects of process, process improvement that can benefit data steward practices. People say, well, wait a minute, why should data stewards get involved in processes? So let's just take that as a, a quick side piece. If we're going to simply improve new controls, this is going to make the water that is coming into the lake of better quality. How long does it take to wash out all the old stuff? Answer, a long time. So we've got to do some other things. And literally, this is low-hanging fruit in most organizations because most organizations spend 20 to 40% of their IT dollars focused specifically on IT waste. It's moving data. It's evolving data. It's improving data. And it just doesn't need to happen, but nobody even uses the techniques to understand this anymore. It's called a data flow diagram. It is not taught as part of the uh, curriculum, has not been taught as part of the curriculum for many, many years. So people look at this tool and go, wow, why didn't you show this to me earlier? <sighs> anyway, obviously I'm giving away my age and grumpiness in terms of sighing like that because I'm married to an accountant. And she looks at me and says, you mean you people don't have your act together? And I said, well, we're not 8,000 years old. She says, okay, it's all right if you're currently immature, but if you're not trying to improve the immaturity, then you're just whining. Don't whine. Good. No problem. But let's be real. Your data is likely a mess, and it requires some professional administrations to make up for its past neglect. It's not just that you haven't changed the oil in your car for the past 10 years, but you're still driving on the same bald tires and the same worn bearings, 
and you've never tuned up the engine, so you're a mess to the environment. It's a hazard in many organizations. Don't be hysterical about it. It doesn't help any, but realize that. Because you can't just say everybody's got to do it better because they don't know what it is. That's your job as a steward, is to show them specific examples of how doing things differently, just small, simple things differently. Let's not get the data from here. Let's get it from here. Or more importantly, maybe we'll put you on a subscription service so that you'll have it delivered to you and we can verify receipt. Right? These are all really interesting ideas, but your folks don't know right now, which means you're the expert. If that scares you, um, look at it as an opportunity. The glass is half full rather than half empty. It is likely that you will need a new business data program, underlining the word program there. It's not a project. You're not given a 90-day initiative to go out and fix things. The cycles, the theory of constraint cycles that I alluded to and described in that one chapter with um, the picture of the book on it, those are projects, but it needs to exist in the context of a program because this joint projects and data are not helpful. It requires a synergy, a critical mass. It is a step function. You do not dabble in it. You go straight forward. Because data strategy, information management, are the major components of what goes on in data. And you are the people who are tasked with doing this. You need to do three things in concert, collectively. You need to improve the organizational data, taking specific, concrete steps to move forward in measurable ways, writing it down as a success process for your own protection. Because if you don't put it down, it doesn't work. Now, I'm going to do a quick side note here and bring my mother into the picture. Why the heck not? I've already uh, called out my wife, so let's bring mom into the picture. Mom was a purchasing manager at Planning Research Corporation, which is the DC belt we've had for many, many years. And as the manager of purchasing, she always kept metadata about how well she was doing. So people would come down and ask her, and she'd say, look, here are the industry averages, and here's how we do against the industry averages. And they'd go, I guess you know what you're doing. And she said they never bothered her, which is almost amazing in a corporate environment, in an area where it's subject to re-engineering time and time again going through that process. Anyway, back into here. Improve the organizational data. Improve the way people use the data. They haven't been taught how to do it. Their PhD may be in statistics, but that doesn't mean they understand application of data. They understand algorithms, not the practical sense of it. But you'll hear this said every day that all of our really good data people spend 80% of their time munging, that's M-U-N-G-I-N-G, munging the data. That's not a good use of their time. There are separate skills that can be developed to do that and show people how to support this better ways. Because only when we've got better data and better ways of people using the data, better, better capabilities of the organization with better data and better people, then can we use data to support strategy. Otherwise, it becomes really hard. And unfortunately, our statistics around data usage are that it has continued on the same pathway that most data projects initiatives have been as successful as most IT initiatives, which is not very successful. And in that context, it means it's really, really hard to show tangible value because you haven't got enough runway length to get the program off the ground in doing this. So to conclude all of this, the only way you can accomplish this is by going through an iterative approach, focusing on one aspect at a time, and applying formal, formal transformation methods crawl, walk, and then run your way to the top. Now, one last slide on this, just some kind of funny chapters. Oops, sorry, you don't want to hear the music there. That's a, by the way, you can Google this. Um, it's called um, uh, yeah, Data Governance Council, Council Data Government. Go Google that, you'll get a copy of this. It's, it's playing right the hotel, California in the background. Anyway. Real quickly, because we've just got one minute. Ten top data stewards practices. You get buy-in to this, but not commitment. And again, there are issues with business versus IT. These are highly problematic issues. You've got to make sure you've got executive support, but everybody needs that. So the reason, the way you make it executive support that works is you make the executive appreciate what goes on. Who says, fire the data stewards? Mine, save me money every year. I would never do such a thing. 
too. Ready, fire, aim. People buy technology and rely over on it. They don't do enough thinking. The Einstein quote on this is fabulous. What it is is that Einstein says, I would spend, if I had 59, excuse me, a minute to live, I'd spend 59 seconds focusing on the problem and one minute implementing the solution. Don't know whether we would have made it, but it's a great example. Trying to solve all the problems at once, not going to work. Well, maybe if I do a too much or too little and just split the dime in the middle, that'll work. Not in this case. Again, step functions are problematic in this. If people are sitting in committees wondering what's going on, you're already at risk and you need to readdress. If you don't implement, if you do just plan, 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 but do not show tangible results, it is a problem. If you don't deal with change management, which is critical on this, again, assuming technology is the answer, building an ongoing sustainable process and ignoring the data shadow systems, which is what actually is occurring in there. So as Shannon mentioned before, we've got a bunch of upcoming events, Data Architecture Summit in Chicago, uh, October next month, and Data Governance Vision in D.C. in the ninth or two uh, really good events. We're going to do three-hour uh, activities of those ideas, Data Architecture Boot Camp and Rekindling Data Governance. And Shannon, I will shut up because I went 28 seconds over. Back to you, Madam. 28 seconds. <laughs> and, you know, I always so panic there as well because <laughs> what I was going to go was say, oh, my God, I've been talking to nobody the time. She dropped off the line, <laughs> and I've been completely disconnected the whole time. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, no, we, we, we'd have complaints. Uh, just to answer the most commonly asked questions before we dive in here, I, uh, just a reminder to everybody, I will send a follow-up email for this webinar by end of day Thursday with links to the slides and links to the recording along with anything else requested. Uh, so uh, to kick us off here, Peter, in our research community's compliance data warehouse, we use a crowdsourcing model of data stewardship. This originated from a relatively small staffing ability at our headquarters level data management division. We have found success. Any comments on that? Fantastic. And most importantly, how can you share that story with the larger community? Because there are wonderful crowdsource opportunities. State government in particular is very, very good at this process. But there's no place for us to go to find out. So I can guarantee you 10 people on this um, uh, uh, webinar are going, oh, I want to find out more. Put your details in the, in the chat part and, and move the discussion over to communitydataversity.net, and, and that's what we want to do. So that, I hope, is favorable comments. Uh, beyond that, it's an excellent way of doing it. It still relies on volunteerism, but gosh, there's a lot of enthusiasm in our community, which is wonderful. Absolutely. You know, and, and, the, and a follow-up question to that, you know, with this, uh, with this approach, is a formal data stewardship position something that we should consider for the future? Yes. So what we're trying to do with data stewardship as a practice is to have people who literally are expert in the data. They may not understand algorithms. These may not be data scientists, but what they do understand is the context, where our data come from and where it is being used. And they understand how the organization does it and how important it is. So if somebody says, well, I'm going to turn that off for 24 hours, they go, ah, that's $6 million in sales. Do you really want to do that? Again, I'm making up an example here in order to do that. But the idea is let's keep this focus on things that are tangible, because if it's all academic, it looks like a science experiment to management, and we most definitely do not want that perception. Love it. So any suggestions on how to get data stewards that are assigned by functional areas to think outside of an application and only on a data level? I love lunch and learns. Do them all the time. We tend to all eat lunch. Sometimes it's fun to sit and listen and learn some stuff. So a lunch and learn in organizations that I encourage them to do is to have the steward community periodically get together, kind of like mini DEMA chapters or data diversity communities, and, and talk about what's going on so that you learn something. I have literally had research scientists who worked together but never talked about their work because that was work and they were friends and until one went to a conference and saw the other one get up and deliver a paper realized that he had invented chocolate and his friend had been working on peanut butter the entire time and they should have had this conversation 10 years ago because we love the combination of chocolate and peanut butter. Mm. <laughs> be hungry. It's lunchtime. Um, <laughs> what would be the first steps towards um, data stewardship in an organization with no skills and resources to do data stewardship activities? Data awareness is low in parts of the business and, parts, and in parts there is uh, reporting work. 
it helps to have a short, wonderful message sent to everybody by the chief executive of the organization. Um, sometimes you're able to achieve that, but I have literally seen organizations pay hundreds, and in one case thousands of dollars, to craft a short one-minute animation that was cute and introduce the concept of stewardship to the organization in general and says, hey, it's not that we're going to go from the um, um, you know, the, the non-data stewardship organization to the best data stewardship organization overnight. It's, we're going to ease into this process, and things are going to be different, and we're going to try to make some changes gradually, and we want you involved in the decision-making process. All of that can be crafted into that one-minute message, but it probably takes 59 times that one minute to come up with content that is useful and, 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 and digestible by your organization. See, governance and therefore stewardship is personal to each organization. You cannot prescribe data governance for every organization across the blanket because organizations and groups within the organization are at different levels of maturity. Very, very difficult to keep all of that together. So it's about reading the room and figuring out what's going to work in the room and making it a repetitive process so that you can get better at the pieces. Let me just give a quick example in parallel here. And I apologize for this sounding like a commercial, but I want to do it to shout out to my guys. So at Data Blueprint, we have a number of product service offerings that we do, and we know how long it takes us and how much effort it produces to do this. And if we go and do X amount of work, it costs the customer Y and is a mutually beneficial transaction. We are getting better at that because if we do the same thing and it takes us less, then we end up being able to save the customer more money in the long run. Well, this is the same process stewards are involved in. It's very entrepreneurial, particularly at first, because we don't have industry-wide numbers that say organizations with data stewards did 20% better in X than organizations without because we haven't got even a baseline to measure what X is, much less what the actual improvement is that over time. I went professor on you there, Shannon. Sorry, but that's a, a great question, and I hope that answered it. No, it's, it's great. Um, always love the longer answers and, and details. Um, and do you have recommended preferred metrics to measure the success of data stewardship within an organization? <laughs> you just queued that one right up for me, didn't you? No. Um, we have surveys that say how many organizations have stewards, but comparing them is, is apples and oranges. We just do not have a basis for comparison. Um, again, many of the leading components are registered, and you can search data diversity for other topics. There are a number of my colleagues that do really excellent work in this area. I've mentioned Dave Plotkin already. There's lots of others that are really good about this. But no, we have not come up with this definitive set of measures, and that's a problem. Accountants can look at how long it takes to close the books each month. Right? Just imagine if they only close the books every once in a while, infrequently, without warning. That would not work out really well. And that's probably closer to what our data world works like. Uh, works like. There we go. That's a good thing. All right. You better shut me up, Shannon. I'm babbling now. <laughs> or can you do like improved uh, data quality or uh, such? Gosh, you know, it's funny. Yeah, great suggestion. So, so again, a stewardship outcome can be we have data that is of poor quality. Um, actually, I can tell you a story for the very first time here because I just got permission to use it. I have a friend named Mel, and uh, she's a data steward for a, an organization. And the rest of the group to welcome her in said, by the way, as the data steward of this organization, you now gain control of the data set that sucks. And Mel kind of went, boy, did I get lucky in this new job, thinking to herself, this is not a good move. And she said, well, why does it suck? And they all kind of looked at each other. This is her coworkers in the organization. And they, they said, well, we don't actually know. Um, you know, it was given to us, and then we were told it was sucks, but we don't really know anything about the data set. It's simply yours now. So I guess if you want to find out why it sucks, you'll have to figure it out yourself. Well, if you know Mel, she is a very determined individual. She dug in with both teeth, made a meal out of the process, came back and said to the same group assembled two weeks later, hey, guys, you know that data set that had uh, it sucked? Guess what? It's 98% accurate. And the room was dead quiet. You could have heard a pin drop. And from that point on, literally, this was a game changer in her organization. Mel is the lady with the 98% accurate data set, and 98% is far higher than they ever thought they would ever achieve in that data set there. So it is possible to develop metrics, but we do not have them across industry yet. Our organizations collectively, these communities that we've spoken about on the, on the call here, are the ones we want to use to develop these. If you're interested, hit me up. I'm happy to speak with you. If not, just jump in at DMA International or data diversity, excuse me, community.dataversity.net. Love it. And uh, Peter, do you believe that training of data stores is best done in-house or by external providers? External providers can give you frameworks that we've 
talked about in the in the set here. Um, working with providers in an actual customization of a framework into something that works for your organization is something that is generally very useful the first couple times. But the goal is to, to sort of quickly work yourself out of a job in that sense. So I think there's value in it, but I would also be extremely cautious about um, organizations tend to like to develop repetitive products. I just told you how our organization likes to develop repetitive products. There's a knownness, a, a quantity that you can put in place, uh, a less squishiness, less risk uh, in order to do this. It's very important to try and get that as quickly as we can in stewardship by having repetitive activities. I'm not talking about mind-numbing factory activities, but I'm talking about the process of responding to a fire as a proactive activity of a data steward community so that the organization gets better about the process. If, the, if the, the expertise is diffused for the organization, it will never become useful. But if you concentrate that expertise in a center of excellence in stewardship or something along those lines, you have the ability to then take that organizational capability and get better. And if you look around and see well-performing companies, you will almost always see somebody from that company presenting at Dataversity events and see how those things work out. Another great way of sharing information among us in the community. Gosh, do I have a theme going today or what, Shannon? <laughs> yes. Um, do you we, uh, assign data stores or hire new ones? Um, digital natives are generally quicker to usefulness in organizations, but people that understand business practices and architecture and can think in systems terms are also useful. So generally a combination of the two. Um, you may hire those digital millennials or digital natives outside of the organization, or you may ask your existing folks to bring in their kids because they're just as likely to get good ones out of the process. Uh, we do it all the time. It's a great trick uh, to work with people. Um, again, hiring new ones can make sense, but if somebody says they were a data steward at Organization X for three years, the next question I would immediately ask is, and, and tell me what you did in terms of moving the needle here. You know, what were the tangible accomplishments that prevented you from, uh, you know, becoming redundant, as the British say? And listing those out will be a very, very strong sign that the individual is focused in the direction that is likely to produce good results for your organization. Uh, absent that, uh, you may have somebody who, who likes to sit around and, and have conference calls and, and you know, do things. But really, our, our goal as stewards is to move the needle. It is not to sit around and pontificate. Ah, now I've cast aspersion of professors, right? <laughs> it's a great word, pontificate. Um, what is the functional difference, if any, between data stewards and data coordinators? Okay. Stewards can perform a coordinator role, but that's a limited subset of stewardship. Coordinator implies that one is actively gaining access, and this may be an instance of your organization has customized that more so than the general population, but coordination implies, you know, somebody needs something, you help get it done. Stewardship would also bring into the picture whether it should get done. Uh, ethics are a very strong component of stewardship. I should add that to this deck uh, and put it in there because that's, that's bad on me to leave it out. Stewards have a fiduciary responsibility, and that fiduciary responsibility is key to driving the stewards in the right direction. Now, it's not that people are always going to do the right thing, but at least stewards will make sure the question is incorporated into the process, and that is critical. Great question. Thanks for prompting my memory on that. So, um, Peter, any thoughts around which stewardship models work best, uh, central, federated, et cetera? You know, we, we had a a paper that was very famous in the uh, late 1980s about whether centralized data processing was better or worse than decentralized. And, and of course, the answer is a uh, Tversky answer, which is the, the, the idea is under which circumstances is it best for which organizations. And I think the, the answer to these three models that you've described is not going to be A, B, and C, but they, a federated model is more complex to administer and maybe is appealing to organizations as a second step after they've gotten their feet wet by involving a limited pilot scope and learning some lessons in private instead of in front of everybody else uh, to do that. Um, again, trying to say a best way is that each of these have strengths and weaknesses, and your job as experts in your organization 
and in your organization's data is to try to figure out how can each of these models improve the way I apply my data to the organization's strategy and save lives, save money, whatever it is, improving effectiveness and efficiencies. Limited number of things. Oh, faster. They're faster, better, and cheaper. That's the way we want to do it. So how do you determine when is the right time to transition between X number of part-time data stewards to Y number of full-time data stewards? This is where business cases are extremely helpful. The process of saying, I've got, and again, I'll use an extreme example. This is probably not correct for your organization, but many organizations are challenged with a variant of this. Stewardship is everybody's responsibility, which really means it's nobody's responsibility, but everybody in our group, 10 people, all develop 10% of their time to data stewardship activities, and we've got it covered. All right, well, it is possible to measure outcomes. It may not be possible to measure the entire outcome, but if you measure part of the outcome and part of the outcome is still a large number, who cares whether you've got all of it or not? I have a, an example where stewards saved an organization in the B billions of dollars. They are heroic within that organization. Uh, great story, you have to save it for some other time. But the idea here again is what can we do by building a case? by focusing in on something specific that allows us to produce value from the organization. Because otherwise, again, just an industry statistic, half of the chief data officers that exist today currently have no staff or no budget. It's a problem either way. And we are still not where we need to be in terms of being able to effectively do our job. So it's we're trying to do more with less. But if you measure the output from these stewards on a part-time basis and then request permission or don't request permission, lie and say, I've got somebody working full-time for a year, and compare the numbers, I think you'll find that the increase in productivity, the increase in organizational capabilities is noticeable from the full-time concentrated effort. Because first of all, it gives you as a steward somebody to work with. And you generally, if you're both motivated in the same direction, will be more productive as a team than you will as an individual. And that other individual can now learn the process as well. Anyway, long-winded answer, but hopefully that gives an approach. Uh, most definitely. Uh, and if you, if you have questions, we still have 15 minutes. You know, uh, feel free to submit them in the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, so, Peter, in an organization where data stewardship does not exist, how do you identify and assign data stewards? That is a great question. So, you can try, of course, the overall process of saying, well, you know, we need to develop a data stewards organization, and it's, you know, it's a big, big issue, and we've got to really think about it, and, you know, let's all get together and, and, and figure out what we're going to do and all that sort of thing. It's hard. I've worked with a lot of organizations from zero to one, right, and, and to get there, and then truly, actually, just for full clarification, it's not zero to one, it's one to two. But from one to two, but you know, one being we have nothing, and then two being we're at the lowest level of the framework, the maturity curve uh, on all the measures in there. The idea is getting that started. If people say, it's working now, why should it be a problem? And then what I tell people is that what we're selling in the data steward community, and really in the data community as a whole, is shoes. But we're selling shoes to a population that has never understood the concept of, cl of, of putting something around your foot. So we get to places. I go outside and I step on acorns and stones and gravel, and, and my feet are tender, and over time they get stronger, and I can go further. I occasionally cut myself. But, you know, we get things done. And, and I'm over here in the corner, the shoe salesman, Al Bundy. Anybody get that joke? Um, anyway, the shoe salesman who's saying, look, if you put these on your feet, things will not be easy, but you will go further. It will take you less time. It will cost less, and it will deliver better results on the other end of it. And everybody says, ah, it's okay, we're doing fine. We've got this feet thing down pretty well. We don't need no stinking shoes. And it seems obvious to us that are in the community, but it is not obvious to everybody else. And the way we make it obvious to them is by finding something that is meaningful to them in the organization and showing how better treatment of data will help to resolve that. I have gone through 100 IT failures in depth as part of a research program, and Literally all of them, of course, involve a data component. And even if it's just a subcomponent of it, it's still a lot of data problems that could be solved by a more unified approach. And that is what we are lacking, but we're moving in the right direction, trying to coalesce the community around these ideas. 
So, Peter, we plan to hire analysts for full-time data stewardship and use the data office as an incubator for their data training. They will participate in uh, an accredited program and work with an agile team. Do you know any examples of success uh, and any lessons learned? I have uh, about 10 organizations right now that are attempting the experiments that I've described to you on this about working within the agile context. but. The first piece of this has to go to literally the definition of the word program and the definition of the word project. And so an agile sprint cannot result in changing data requirements or data requirements that are less precise at the end of the sprint than they are at the beginning of the sprint. And if you use that as a guideline, I think you'll find that Agile works very, very well at doing what it does best, which is creating better high-quality software faster around the process. And you need a data program that is synonymous with your HR program. After all, nobody in your organization says, we've done a whole bunch of data around here. I'm sorry, we've done a whole bunch of hiring around here. I don't think we're going to hire anybody else, right? We, we just, we're done with it. HR people, you guys can go find other work that's uh, you know, within the organization, but we don't need an HR function anymore. Of course, that's ludicrous. And yet, we have exactly the same role to play organizationally as not recognized. And until we as a community pull together stories around this, and this is something else that will help with your motivations as well. Does your organization have a burning bridge issue? Many organizations have an oopsie, uh, you know, Equifax, for example, uh, a little oopsie there, or uh, Marriott Hotels, right? Lost my passport number. Uh, these are interesting things. By the way, the Marriott passport numbers, interestingly enough, never showed up on the dark web, which means they're probably in the bad guy's hands rather than in the, uh, the hacker's community's hands. That's a story that might be very interesting to management to pay attention to this. The, the target board of directors was attacked by shareholders for mismanagement of their data assets during the target break-in. These are things that can get management's attention, but hopefully not in a, in a threatening way. Hopefully you guys can make a proactive case on that. Of course, if you need some help, give us a shout. Happy to help. <laughs> Perfect. And uh, are data stewards typically senior managers or specialized data analysts or SMEs? Well, and it's of course the typical answer of it depends, but let's go back and look specifically. So, and let me pull the chart up, and if you'll reread the question to me again so I can fix it. Sure. Oh, there we go. So you guys will recall I was just babbling and had, you know, the way we define this IT is the pillar, and we've got some attributes of each of these, but uh, they, you know, fall different areas within here, and here's our four pieces up here. So again, leadership, stewards, participants, experts, and other sources and uses. Shannon, the question was? Yes, so are data stores typically senior managers or specialized data analysts or SMEs? And again, that's going to vary from organization to organization. There is not a standard practice. What you will find in organizations is that they are people who are passionate about this. Larger organizations decide that stewards must resign at a job classification level, so then they say, well, only if you manage 10 people can you be a steward, and you know, other arbitrary rules around this as well that aren't really enforced by any good scientific basis for doing this. Um, your data stewards should be the people that you trust to manage data as an organizational asset uh, in support of your strategy. And they should make sure that actually gets done. They are not necessarily the doers, but they are the people that are making sure it gets done. If we put a racy matrix up, you'd see how that works, but I don't have that slide prepared. So could be senior managers, but I've seen organizations where the stewards actually reside out on the field and, 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 and are fairly uh, low. The, the key is who are the people that need to be acting as trustees? And that trustee implies a fiduciary relationship, and that fiduciary relationship puts them in the class of accountants, of lawyers, of um, other people who have to, health professionals who have to uh, protect information. And Peter, can you recommend a certification in data stewardship? I know some companies have certainly created their own. I'm um, aware of a specialized uh, uh, governance stewardship certification for the um, uh, government uh, that is run by a private company in conjunction with the ICCP. DEMA also has some certifications that are available. Um, 
again, what we're lacking overall is the official decision as to what is a standard around these areas. That's a community discussion that simply hasn't occurred yet. Um, what I would look for if you're seeking private uh, assistance in that area is that they draw from what are clearly the um, uh, ad, uh, excuse me, a priori standards in the field, which is the data management maturity model from CMMI and the um, uh, Dimbach from DEMA in those areas. If they're not using those, uh, I would really question what is the basis for uh, the certification uh, in that. For example, I, and just a couple interesting ones, but there's a, uh, a certification for chief data officers out of George Mason University. George Mason is my alma mater. I'm thoroughly pleased with that. I think it's out of the public policy school as opposed to um, you know, perhaps a data engineering group of expertise in there. And, and these are going to influence these choices, which is what's going to make all of these things work within the organization uh, to the degree that it actually works with what you're trying to do. Anyway, hopefully that made sense. You, you tell me if it didn't make sense, right, Shannon, if I was just sort of word salading um, over here. Yeah, and, and I know um, that, they, that the community here will uh, let you know if it doesn't <laughs> yeah, right. as well. We love that. That's very uh -huh. helpful, guys. Uh, you know, typos and slides <laughs> even are, are useful, sure. <laughs> Our community is not shy. <laughs> um, so there's, yeah, one person in uh, my org that is doing data governance, working with a group of service line leaders to build a dictionary. How can we show value? I think this should be multidimensional to show value. The value in a dictionary is not showing through. Uh, great question and very practical application because guidance around this is that if very difficult to actually do things good with your data if you can't at least name it, and that's what a data dictionary is all about is starting glossaries or dictionaries or, or uh, uh, metadata repositories, however you're deciding to approach the process of writing things down and, and formalizing more what actually works uh, out on this. Uh, so the context here is that as you're trying to look at each of these specific instances of defining things, don't again start at A and say we'll work our way through until we get to Z, but instead focus in on something that directly affects the problem and then take lessons from that process to reapply so that you can get better at what it is that you do. Shannon, I think I wandered off there. Would you reread that question real quick? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> there is one person in my organization that is doing data governance working with a group of service line leaders to build a dictionary. So how can we show the value of a data dictionary? Because it's Thanks. not currently okay. going. Great question. Yes, that's what I said before. And then sort of lost the train of thought. Anyway, um, value of the data dictionary. So I wouldn't try to quantify it. I, I did spend uh, the, num the, the summer of 1993 in the basement of the Pentagon literally shoveling metadata into one of the DOD data repositories because somebody had promised that there would be 17,000 terms in that dictionary by August 17th. Why I remember that, I'm not sure. Probably the alliteration. Uh, but anyway, just having numbers of, of, of data items in the data dictionary is, is good and that's comprehension. But having a couple things defined well and showing that defining those things well improved the business practices, support for the rich in these tangible areas is better. And so rather, again, than trying to be comprehensive about the process, uh, focus in on a narrow area and show how bringing clarity and definition and more importantly, accurate information about the data to the process has helped the organization uh, improve its productivity. Again, let's just take a, an example here completely out of the blue. If law enforcement understood that facial recognition software had a 10% misinterpretation for many types of individuals, they would be probably more careful about its application. And yet, Data and policing is an important concept that tends to be done in another part of the organization, whereas what we really need to understand is how the folks on the job use this to do the protection serve mission that they have. Does it make sense? 10% of errors here, I would be a lot more careful about what's actually happening if a 10% error was done. Now, interestingly enough, you can Google this and find out that they did it for the um, I believe it was the San Francisco Board of uh, Supervisors and, and came up with those statistics. And they did it, I think, also for the U.S. Congress and got similarly disappointing statistics. It's not that facial recognition doesn't work, but it has its strengths and its limitations and needs to be used and understood in this context, which, as I said before, also gets us to some ethical considerations. But gosh, Shannon, we are almost at the half hour, so I'd better shut up or you will get frustrated with me and just pull the plug on us, right? All of a sudden, we'll just go quiet. Beep. <laughs> 
<laughs> Indeed. Well, that does bring us to, to almost to the half hour. I don't know that we can get, there's a couple other questions here, but I don't know that we can get to them in less than a minute here. Um, so I will pass those on to Peter. Maybe we can get some a couple of uh, written answers for the follow-up. And just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email uh, by end of day Thursday for this webinar to all registrants with links to the slides, links to the recording of this presentation, along with Peter's information as well. And uh, continue the conversation and networking, as Peter has mentioned, and uh, you can go to community.net. And thanks, everybody, to uh, to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. I uh, just love it. I love all the networking back and forth and the communication you guys have going on. It's just the best ever. And as we have you can a full see, fall ahead of us. Oh, I love it. It's awesome. And we put together the uh, 2020 series already, so I am cool. I am excited that. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys for participating in this. And thank you, Shannon, for hosting us as always. Thanks, Peter. Have a great day. You bet. Thanks, Bob. Sure.